Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the No Silicast Podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Wednesday, May 15th, 2024, and this is show number 993. We can tell by the day and date that the podcast is quite a bit early this week because Steve and I are going off to visit the grandkids this weekend. That means there is no live show on Sunday, May 19th. I do not want to hear later that someone was sitting all sad and lonely in the chat room wondering where everybody ran off to. It also means that I'm sitting all sad and lonely doing this recording because I have nobody in the chat room with me. Well, before we kick into the show, I want to remind everyone that every episode of every podcast I create comes with a full transcript. The last link in the show notes in your podcatcher, before the spammy bits at the end, is the transcript generated by Whisper AI through the service I use called Auphonic. I'm reminding you of this right now because we have three segments this week that don't have blog posts, but you can still reread and look up details you heard by looking for the chapters in the show notes. We have Tom from New Hampshire talking about the Belkin Auto Tracking Stand Pro with DotKit. Then we have an interview with Thinkerbell Labs from the CSUN Assistive Tech Conference. And in this interview, they talk about Annie, their self-learning Braille literary device. Finally, we have a conversation with Pat Dingler, Steve, and me about a cool success story working with Tesla Service. But first, I have a story to tell. Last week, I was on one of my dog walks, and as I got close to home, I noticed a backpack on the median in front of the sidewalk across from my house. In our neighborhood, anything sitting on that little strip of grass on the outside of the sidewalk essentially has an invisible sign on it that says, free, take me. As I got closer, I realized it was a really nice to me backpack. I don't know if you've ever shopped to me, but their backpacks are typically well outside of my price range at around $500 to $600. It was pretty clear to me that no one in the right mind would just throw away a bag like this, so I rescued it with the intention of trying to find the owner. I remembered that before I left the house to go on my walk, there was a worker's truck in front of the house where I found the backpack. I remember the worker had his door open on the grassy median and he was doing some stuff, and I figured he would probably forgot the backpack when he drove away. I opened the backpack and I found a little notebook with a gentleman's business card taped into the front cover. I called the number on the card and I left a voicemail for him explaining him that I'd seen him earlier and I assumed he'd just forgotten the bag. I told him where I lived and I gave him my phone number so he could contact me when he got the message. Then I started digging around more inside the bag and I made a very surprising discovery. Stuffed inside this very fancy, classy, masculine backpack was a woman's leather purse. It was clearly stolen. And I had just called the thief and told them where I live and my phone number. Yikes! Well, after confessing to Steve what I'd just done, I made a quick pivot on the situation and I called our local police department. By the way, here's a little PSA. I highly recommend recording the non-emergency phone number for your local police and your contacts, as it can come in quite handy for just this kind of situation. I mean, I wasn't going to call 911 or anything, knowing that just local number was a good thing to know. I was assured by dispatch that an officer would be coming out to our house, but they were on a shift change, so it might be a bit before they showed up. At this point, Steve and I were both a bit nervous about the call I'd made, and we decided we wouldn't answer the door unless it was the police officer. Steve closed the front curtains, and we stayed away from the door. We weren't really hiding, but we weren't going near that door unless it was the police officer. While we were waiting, I did some more digging. I found in the backpack a receipt for a rental car at the Los Angeles airport and a parking stub for a lot at Chicago's airport, and a rental car receipt. I found a second business card with the same name as was on the inside of the notebook. On both business cards, he was shown as the CFO of two different companies outside of Chicago. Then, in a kind of hidden but large pocket, I found a set of $400 Bose over-the-ear headphones. Putting all of this together, very expensive backpack, very expensive headphones, business cards as a CFO in another state, receipts for parking and rental car, I was pretty sure this wasn't left behind by the person working out of their truck, and I was also confident it wasn't the thief of the woman's purse. I started realizing that a thief had stolen both the Toomey backpack and the woman's purse. I was relieved because that meant I hadn't given the thief my phone number and address. But it was time to dig into the woman's purse, and I was quite surprised to find her wallet, Her driver's license and all of her credit cards and other cards were still there. Her address on the driver's license was not too far away from us. In fact, it was right around the corner from some friends of ours. So then, but then we didn't really want to like drive to her house. 
Instead, we began a sleuthing exercise to find her phone number online. I don't know if you've ever tried to do a reverse lookup online, knowing somebody's name and where they live, but it can be kind of challenging. You kind of have to put clues together to find the right person. Since I had the victim's name and complete address, I was able to find her pretty quickly, but the number I found listed was not in service. I then went through the cards in her wallet, and I found an insurance card with a man's name on it, but the same last name as her. I deduced this was probably her husband's insurance card. Steve did some more digging online with all this information, this time using the man's name with her address, and he got another phone number. I called the gentleman's phone number and made the call, but as expected, he didn't pick up this strange number. I called a second time, and something really interesting happened. A synthesized voice answered and said, Hello, this is Google Assistant. The owner of this number wanted me to inquire on why you might be calling. Isn't that cool? Well, I said, I think I found your wife's stolen purse. Well, in about two seconds, the gentleman came online and said, really, you found the purse? At this moment, he and his wife were in the Verizon store getting her a new phone because that's what she needed the most. So he put her on the line to talk to me. She explained that she'd been at a gas station pumping gas into her car when someone came up on the passenger side, smashed in the window, grabbed her purse from the car and drove away. This was truly a terrible day for her. I asked her if she was going to do a police report, and she said yes, but she'd spent the afternoon canceling her credit cards and, of course, now getting a new phone. I told her the only bit of good news she was going to have that day. Because I found her purse and wallet, she would not have to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles to get her driver's license replaced. She was weary, but certainly happy about that. She said they'd just gotten to the Verizon store and asked if they could meet up with me at a local coffee shop when they were done. I joke that, well, since you just started there, it's going to be about six or seven hours at Verizon. At least that's how long it takes me at Verizon. A little while later, after we hung up, the doorbell rang. We were still a little bit wary, so we checked our video doorbell before answering, and we saw a police officer, so we answered the door. We let him in, and after I got to tell my story of heroism again, he asked if we could call the woman back, and he could talk to her. I called the husband's number, and he immediately said, Oh, we're right at the end of the transaction at Verizon. Can she call you back? I said, well, there's a police officer right here wants to talk to her. So she came on the line. After he confirmed with her that she did want to file a police report, he said he was going to take both her purse and the backpack to the station, and she could meet him there to file the report and get her purse back. As much as I'd enjoyed telling this woman that I'd found her purse, I was kind of glad to wash my hands of this and let him try to find the backpack owner. After the excitement, I called my friend Pat Dengler to tell her all of this because I'd been on the phone with her when I found the backpack, and I sort of dropped her like a hot potato. She said, I wonder if any of your neighbors have video cameras that might have captured the thief. Wait a minute. I have video cameras. Three of them should have at least had a partial view of the curb where the backpack was dropped. Now we get to talk about another tech angle. In our living room, we have a Eufy cam that lives indoors but points out the front window. Its job is to get a good view of the driveway and the front walkway up to our house. We have a second Eufy cam stuck to the inside glass of our garage door, which gives it a perfect view of the driveway and the house across the street where the bag was dropped. The third camera is an old Wise cam that's supposed to be an indoor cam, but we keep it outdoors anyway because we don't trust Wise cams inside our house. For the price we paid for it, it survived quite well through the harsh winters of Southern California. I chose Eufy cams to replace my Wise cams a few years ago, before Wise cams' third major security breach, and I chose Eufy because the cameras are HomeKit compatible. They can have their own internal storage like the Wise cams, but since they're compatible with HomeKit, you can enable HomeKit secure video on them. When enabled for HomeKit secure video, all recordings are stored in iCloud. If you pay for any version of iCloud Plus, you can have at least one camera's video stored in iCloud, more cameras as you go up in tiers. The only downside to HomeKit Secure Video is that even if you have higher resolution cameras, you have to set them to 1080p. Our Eufy cams are 2K and it just killed me to have them at 1080p, but the video is really pretty clear and crisp, even at 1080p. In HomeKit, for each camera, you can choose whether to have the cameras just stream video on demand or stream and record to iCloud. You can also choose whether to have the recordings go to iCloud when no one is home. Since I really don't want the cameras inside my house constantly recording our activities, I set them all to only record when we're not home. So it does geofencing on our, on our phones. So when we leave the house, we get a little alert that says, hey, I've just switched all the cameras over to, uh, to start recording. And when we come back, 
it stops recording. Well, you can see the problem here, right? Our super crisp and clear Eufy cams didn't record anything going on across the street when the stolen backpack and purse were dropped off because Steve was home while I was out on the walk. I've since then changed the outward-facing garage Eufy to record at all times, so now I have recordings of every dog walker, stroller pusher, and commuter car that drives by my house. But our poor old wise cam that's been suffering outside in the wind, rain, and sun all these years had an SD card in it, so it was doing continuous recording. Steve was able to isolate a 20-second clip of the thief dropping off the backpack. In the video, you can see the curb and grasp with no backpack, and then you see a car drive up and slow down. As it pulls away, you can clearly see a black blob on the grassy median. Then you see the car go to the corner, hang a U-turn, and come back in view of the camera and drive back up to the right. Steve studied the car and especially the specialized wheels and determined it appears to be a dark gray 2016 to 2019 Nissan Sentra with custom five-spoke wheels. Unfortunately, the video was not of sufficient resolution to make out a license plate number. Steve sent off the video to the officer, but we haven't heard back from him yet. I don't suspect that we will. But if you want to see the video, it's in the show notes. I did get a text back from the husband of the woman whose purse was stolen, thanking me again for helping them get her belongings back from the police officer. Since I had the gentleman's attention, I told him how cool I thought it was that he had Google Assistant screen his calls so he knew to pick up my call. He proudly answered, yeah, it's pretty cool. Come standard with all Google Pixel phones. Well, dang it, now I want a Google Pixel. A day or two later, I got a text message from the owner of the backpack. By the time he wrote back to me, he was back in Chicago, but because of my help, the police officer had contacted him and they arranged for him to pick up his belongings when he returns to Los Angeles in a couple of weeks. I don't think the officer had told him much about, about the backpack, so I got to tell him that his Bose headphones were still in it. I asked him how his backpack was stolen, and he explained that he was putting gas in a rental car at a gas station, a different one from where it happened to the woman, and someone walked up and took the backpack right out of the front seat. So two different cars in two areas about 10 miles apart had their cars broken into at gas stations. When I told this story to fellow Tesla owner Pat, she said, yet another good reason to get an electric vehicle. Hey, everybody. This is Tom here from New Hampshire. Hope everyone's doing well. Wanted to talk to you today about a new toy I got, and I want to thank Allison for it. She recommended it. She interviewed the people at uh, one of the conferences. This is the Belkin Auto Face Tracking Stand, and I want to speak about it from the blindness perspective and accessibility perspective for a minute. I have a lot of family. We're all around the country. I'm here in New Hampshire. I have a sister in Florida, brother in New York. Brother in Mass, we're all around the country. Brother in Pennsylvania. My mother likes to get on one of people's birthdays and do a FaceTime call. That's all well and good. Except when you can't line up your camera. It won't be a problem going forward. What this stand does is you put your phone in it. The best thing for me, I like it a lot. It's MagSafe. You stick the phone there, boom. Click, whatever you want to call it. It sticks right to it. It's excellent. The bottom of this thing is a little disc. And at the top of it, I call it the hat. Let's go over and take a look at it, shall we? So I can tell you a little bit more. And what it does is you put your phone, MagSafe, right to the top. Now, what makes it so great? It's motorized. You plug it in. It uses USB-C, which everything is, is becoming more and more USB-C these days. That's excellent. So you stick the phone to it. And when you're sitting at your desk, if you move, the base will turn with you. It will follow you around the room. So as long as you are within, my friend and I tested this, within about 15 or 20 feet, it's going to see you no problem. As long as it's straight on and you're looking right at it, it won't be a problem. It will keep you in focus the entire time. I've done it over FaceTime now and I've done it over signal video calls. They work great. A little tricky for taking pictures. I haven't figured that part out yet. I think what I'm going to try and do is set a timer next and see if that works. I think it will. I took a picture, it posted recently for the Red Sox home opener back on the 9th of April. And uh, that picture was all me taking it with the stand. It's a little tricky. You don't want to knock it out of position when you're trying to snap the picture. You're trying to look down at the phone. But if you can set the timer, it shouldn't be a problem, I wouldn't think. Or you can trigger it from your watch. You can also trigger your phone from your watch and take a picture that way. But 
This thing is an excellent, excellent thing. Shouldn't have any more problem with those family get-togethers. The only problem is I'm going to have to remember to turn on the lights. Because I could be rolling around my apartment talking to these people, and they don't see me because the lights are off. Well, now, if I'm using this, I turn the lights on. Oh, well. Okay, I guess I can handle that. Not that anybody's going to see me anyway. They're all running around doing their own thing anyway. But anyway, it's a little expensive. However, you get it from Amazon, and Amazon gives you a choice. If you have Prime, at least. I can pay for it all at once, or I can pay for it in six payments. So there you go, folks. Go out and get your own Belkin Auto Face trucking stand today. Thank you for supporting the podcast wherever and however you can, and uh, stay subscribed. Well, thanks so much for that, Tom. I love the idea of you rolling around the apartment with the lights off, forgetting nobody can see you. Well, the official name for the device Tom describes is the Belkin Auto Tracking Stand Pro with Dot Kit, and it costs $180. I put a link in the show notes to Steve's video where I interviewed Jen Warren from Belkin about a lot of their other products, including the audio, the Auto Tracking Stand Pro. In the video, you can see and hear Jen demonstrating it. So she's kind of jumping around. She's doing deep knee bends, and you can see the phone following her, just like Tom describes. I really like that Tom was able to find this as a great accessibility device for him after hearing about it from our video from CES. All right, let's listen to Thinkerbell Labs now as they tell us about a device called Annie to help people, especially kids, learn Braille. I'm with Sanskriti Davle in the Thinkerbell Labs, and she's going to tell us about a product called Annie. Hi, thank you for having me. So this is Annie. Annie is the world's first Braille literacy device. It helps children learn how to read, write, and type in Braille. So we start right from uh, you know large size Braille displays for young children who are learning dot combinations, and we graduate to standard size Braille. Uh, we also I'm have stop you for a real quick second. This yeah. is also for an audio audience. So imagine the whole audience is blind. All right. And so describe what you're what you're pointing at. She's okay. got a box that's uh, maybe ten or twelve inches square. Yes. And then you just pointed to some yes. giant on, braille. Uh, yes. On the top cells. left of this box, we have uh, two giant braille cells, and then uh, sliding over to the top right, we have six standard size braille cells, eight dots each. Then going below, we have a Perkins style keyboard with soft touch keys, and then right below that, uh, we have uh, the world's first digital writing slate. So for braille, so you can use your normal normal stylus and, uh, uh, you know, emboss uh, your dots and Annie, which is the name of the device, uh, Annie is named after Anne Sullivan, Helen Keller's teacher and Annie teaches children, uh, you know, how to acquire these skills of uh, reading, writing and typing by uh, through audio guided lessons and games. Oh, so th- okay. That, so that's, that's, that's now a lot of my has. audience is not blind, but they'll be listening to this. So you said there's, uh, I've always been confused by this. These big, the big braille displays are two sets of six dots. Yes. But the standard ones are eight. Yes. So how do you learn using six dots, but you actually need Go eight? Go to, to eight. Yeah, so uh, the six dots are mainly intended to familiarize students with the two by three uh, dot layout. Uh, typically, uh, people use, uh, you know, egg cartons or your muffin tins so that children can learn the two by three uh, layout of Braille. Is two by first. three just letters, but when you do eight, you can do punctuation? Or? You, can do, you can do a lot more with eight. Like, in fact, most refreshable Braille devices have eight dots because you use the bottom two as cursor as well. Uh, to indicate how you're reading or writing in terms of, uh, well, document creation, note-taking, that sort of thing. So the the design intent of Annie is once uh, children learn on Annie, they should be able to pick up any Braille device out there that they want, whether it's, uh, you know, paper and traditional book or whether it's an, uh, uh, an advanced RBD, they should be able to use all of it. And so we train them for all of it. The, the six dot ones is just for the, uh, you know, dot combination learning, while the eight dot one is the one we... Uh, actually support. So in English, for you have grade one and grade two braille across six dots, but we also support a host of other languages. Uh, in India, we have 14 Indian languages and uh, we're also supporting Arabic in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, so, uh, so eight dots is standard marker. braille. Yes, uh, for, for some languages, we do use eight dots for the braille itself. I did not know that. That's really cool. So there's there's a six little pads I can, I can press on and that's doing the, the it, that's can only do six dots, right? Yes. So, uh, so, yes. So there are also these two the dots under it. If you do need to use the um, other two dots, which excuse me, 
for english is not the case so uh, we don't go into that for the english uh, lessons but of course for other languages uh, they are mapped to these eight keys in total oh i see i yes. see can you make it talk to us at all Right. Where, where's the speaker? Is that here? This is the speaker. Okay, I'm yes. gonna just put the mic down by the speaker. All right. Whack a braille. Okay. Do you want to play whack a braille? Yeah. Okay. Let's play whack a braille. In this game, I will tell you which braille dots to press, and you will have to press that dot down on the large braille display. For example, if I say dot two, you have to press dot two down on the large braille display. For every dot you press correctly, you get a point. You have 30 seconds to whack as many dots correctly as possible. So the quicker you are, the higher you score. Press space to start the game. Press left to listen to the instructions again. So that's whack a braille, like whack a mole. Yes, yeah. yeah so, yeah, you get I want to play. All right, let's go. Steady. Seconds. Go. I don't know what. Got. Okay. Go ahead. Press anything. I'll tell you what you Use the large Just braille oh. cell dot. Got. Go. Six. There you oh, go. That's good. Four. Now you know what dot six is. Let's see. Uh, Oh, I'm, I'm rocking this game. I can play whack a braille. Yeah, you can whack a braille all day. But so yeah, basically, so for children who don't know how to get started with uh, something like this, or or they they might not have a a braille tutor, you know, sitting with them every single day. So that's where Annie can help because uh, you know your teacher. Well, you scored three points. Well done. <laughs> Yay! Go yeah, go me. Go <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, Annie uh, connects to an online platform called uh, Helios. That uh, that you know allows teachers to uh, assign homework and uh, create vocabulary with cu so cus for custom dictation tests and things like that in keeping with what the child is learning in the classroom along with their peers. Okay, so is any sold through school the school district and stuff, or can somebody buy this for their home? Well, in India, uh, sorry, in uh, in the USA, we partner with APH, so they sell Polly through the Quota program. Uh, Polly is the U.S. cousin of Annie, and uh, Polly has U.S. accent English, uh, uh, you know, phonics, uh, some lessons with YouTuber Jack Hartman, and uh, well, yeah, overall, it's adapted for the U.S. students, and uh, you can you can get Polly through the APH website or A sure APH, yes, American Printing House. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, do you uh, sort of you know talk to a U.S. audience primarily, or uh, more more U.S. than elsewhere, but. We like everybody. Okay, so uh, Polly, uh, Polly is available in the U.S. via APH, and we're also available in the U.K., uh, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand via Humanware. Oh, very good. With via Humanware, you said. Yes. How much does it cost? Uh, so uh, it via Humanware it costs around one thousand five hundred pounds, depending yeah, volume, on volume. You said. No, via Humanware, it oh. costs £1,500 because all of these are country-specific pricings. In the U.S., actually, uh, since Poly is available under quota, you have APH retailing Poly at $1,000. So it's it's a really great deal. Oh, great, great, great. Well, thank you very much. Again, the company is Thinkerbell Labs, yes. and the product is called Annie or Poly, depending yeah. on your country. Uh, thank course. you very much. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you for having me. Remember how earlier in the show I was explaining that you get transcripts of every podcast I produce? The service Auphonic that I mentioned provides those transcripts, along with leveling the audio and making it meet the loudness standards. It pushes the converted MP3 file to my server, and it publishes the video to YouTube too. All of this costs money, and this show doesn't have ads. If you appreciate the transcripts, or you appreciate that the audio sounds great, or maybe you even appreciate being able to play a static image with audio on top of it on YouTube, consider becoming a patron of the PodFeed podcast by going to podfeed.com slash Patreon. I could really use your help paying those bills. I have two guests with me this week for an interview that's going to go on to two shows. You're going to be hearing this possibly on the Nocilla cast, or you might be hearing this on Bodie Grimm's wonderful Kilowatt podcast. I'm going to do introductions just in case people don't know the players, depending on where they're coming from. I have the most awesome Pat Dangler, who is an Apple certified consultant and a happy Tesla owner. How are you doing today, Pat? Hey, Allison. 
<laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I've also got Steve Sheridan, my husband and videographer and producer of my show. How are you doing today, Steve? Hi, Allison. Thanks for having me on. I've heard somebody refer to you as my pocket electrical engineer, and that is going to be part of your task today uh, in case uh, Pat or I get something uh, messed up in the uh, description of what happened here. I'll do my best. Okay. So, Pat, you have uh, a Tesla, and you got that around um, uh, July of 2022, right? Correct. Yes. So and almost years. And when you bought that car, uh, you had a home wall charger installed right around the same time? Yes. All right. I had uh, hired my electrician, a really nice fellow named Patrick. All right, who, good. Uh, so, so let me jump in already. <laughs> oh, Steve is here to correct things. So this is a Tesla wall connector, to be technically correct. Right. Uh, so it's it's supplied by Tesla. It's not a third party. And it's a connector, not a charger, because it just simply provides the house power into your car, into in which the charger is built in. The charger is built into the car? Correct. So it's just supplying AC power to your car. Your car does the conversion from AC to DC and to charge the battery. But everyone calls it a wall charger, so I'm fine just staying with that. I think Tesla's term is wall, wall connector. Yeah. Wall connector. Wall connector. That's well, what's on the box. Which do we want to call it? Because it's going to be important. More people will know it as a wall charger. Okay. Even though. All right. We may call it different things. So um, I believe the one that you chose was the Generation 3 wall charger. Correct. All right. So this story is going to get interesting. We're just trying to lay down the facts here to get started. <laughs> um, all right. In When you have a wall charger or wall connector connected, any kind of a charger for your electric vehicle into your home, um, it kind of matters how much uh, amperage you can supply to the circuit in your in your home to be able to supply to the to the car. Yeah, uh, did I say anything stupid yet, Steve? Yeah, well, it's both current. Uh, it's both voltage and amperage. So the wall connector or charger supplies uh, is, is designed to work off 240 volts and many different amperages up to 60 amps. Okay. So, Pat, how many amps? So, I said amperage. I probably should have said current. Same thing, but you'll hear us say amps quite a bit here. So, Pat, how many uh, how many amps is your circuit? Do you know? Steve? <laughs> so, so, Pat has a 50-amp circuit, meaning there's a 50-amp circuit breaker that supplies uh, 240 volts to that wall connector, that wall charger. So, why is that important, Steve? Well, that determines the maximum amount of current that you can continuously provide to your car to charge it. And because of some rating and uh, safety margin, uh, the uh, you can provide up to 80% of the circuit breaker, breaker's rating. So a 50 amp circuit breaker can provide 40 amps of continuous power to your car. That's different than some types of circuits that don't continuously use the power, but an EV is the most demanding type of uh, load on a circuit breaker because it, it runs for hours at the full current. So the reason this is important, how many amps you uh, have in the, in the circuit is because it's going to define how quickly you can charge your car. Now, we're going to use as our frame of reference only Teslas, but you might get different mileage depending on which, uh, or different speeds of charging depending on which vehicle you have. And it's even different between a Model 3 and a Model Y and a Model S and a Model X. So um, we're, we're kind of going to just talk in a middle range here. Normally, uh, with a 40 amps, a 50 amp circuit where you're getting 40 amps, Pat, do you remember how much you normally get, what, what speed it says in the car? Like how many miles per hour of range are you getting to add with that? So I don't exactly. Um, I am. I look in the app, and it tells me that I get nine kilowatt hours, kilowatts, nine kilowatts, kilowatts specifically. Um, when I have it charged at, um, I set it to forty amps. Now I wasn't before. It would let me go up to forty-eight amps. It still does, actually. But I learned from Steve that that wasn't a good thing. So now I bring that down at home to 40 amps and I'm getting nine kilowatts in the in the 
you know, what it shows. And I can tell you that probably in about an hour, I'm going to roughly math this. It's about 6% an hour of charge. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me jump us to what we know, which is we normally get, don't we get around 25 or 30 miles per hour of charge, Steve, at home on a 40 it's, effective no, 40 no, it's, circuit? It's about 34 miles per hour of charge. Okay. Okay. 34 to 35. And that should be comparable to Pat's as well, since she also has a Model Y. Okay. Yeah. So you can see how much instantaneous power it's drawing, which is that nine kilowatts you're talking about. Yep. Okay. So all this has been the setup to everything's been going great. By the way, that nine, it's 9.6. And you just get that by multiplying the 240 volts times the 40 amps. You get 9.6 kilowatts. Oh, okay. That's how much power is flowing into your car. Okay. okay. I, I told you it was good. We were going to have adult supervision on this, Pat. <laughs> so <laughs> a few weeks ago, Pat texts us and says that her charger isn't working. What, what was the symptom? What did you notice that something was amiss? So I um, normally have been plugging in my Tesla at night and the app is set to automatically start charging at midnight. And I'm lucky enough to have solar panels and a Tesla battery. So it pulls from the battery. And when it needs more, which it does, because it only gets um, five kilowatts from the battery at any one moment, and it usually pulls around 10-ish. Um, so the balance it gets then from the grid. And and overnight, it's it should it'll deplete the battery to you know whatever the maximum I allow it to deplete. And then the met, the rest it gets from the grid. And usually by morning, my car is charged up to the 80% maximum that I have it set to charge to fill the battery. Well, this morning in particular, I opened the app and it said that instead of charging at 40 amps, it was 21 or so. Oh. And I looked and my car was not up to charged up to 80%, which is really unexpected. Um, and, uh, I was looking and, and I thought, well, everything is connected properly. I, I checked the, um, breakers that nothing had, you know, flipped or anything. And I thought, you know, let me restart is always the, the first <laughs> response that I do. Turn it off and on again. Yeah. So I actually flipped the breakers for the charger and then flipped them back on again after I, I had unplugged the car first, just to be sure. So I flipped them on. <laughs> waited a breath, flipped them back on again. And now I was getting zero. The wall connector, wall charger was not working at all. Oh, wow. It was blinking red lights. And when I went to troubleshoot this first in the app, the instruction was to figure out the pattern of the lights. And I found that blinking red light was the answer. And it and it was a drop down menu that you can go through that says okay is it you know what are the lights doing it's blinking three times okay and then you continue to choose um a couple more questions it asks uh, this is all in the app this is all in the app yeah and uh in the end it basically said call your electrician so you called steve so i called steve <laughs> yes and i am not an electrician <laughs> Well, but to get an understanding of what was possibly going on. Yeah, and, and to see how I could possibly fix this thing because, you know, I, in my estimation, it wasn't that old and there wasn't any indication that it shouldn't, you know, be working, that, that, that you know, it didn't get hit by anything. Um, you know, everything else in the house is working fine, you know, so. Yeah, so Steve, in addition to being an electrical engineer and just darn interested in this kind of stuff and studies it, he also is pretty active in the Tesla Motor Club forums where you, he's got a lot of contacts. He knows a lot of what people have talked about. So you you did some research at that point or had you already heard stuff like about this? I've seen many posts about uh, Tesla wall chargers, wall connectors that have gone bad. And many of them are... Pretty ugly, and some of them are downright scary in terms of uh, fire hazard to that house. So uh, because of these scare stories, I was concerned about maybe the problem, maybe Pat was experiencing a similar problem where this is common. If they're not installed quite correctly, um, they can, a fire can be caused by 
the contacts and the wires not being bolted down with sufficient torque. They, they really need a strong contact. The wires that come in that feed the 240 volts contact a, a couple connectors and the bolts need to be so many foot pounds of torque. If you don't have that, because uh, the electricity is 60 hertz, it actually can vibrate if they're loose and they can vibrate loose, uh, causing arcing, causing heat. Heat causes more re uh, resistance, which is a feedback loop. So that causes more heat and they can catch on fire. They can burn up. Before I knew all that part, after he, Steve had said in our text message thread, he said, well, uh, I've heard that if it's not, uh, they're not torqued down to this 50 foot pounds, you really, uh, you can run into this problem. And I know Pat's super handy. And, you know, as a mechanical engineer, it sounds great. Pop the cover off, Pat, torque them down. And Steve writes back, no, don't touch it. <laughs> Basically, don't have anything. To, I had no idea what, what we were really talking about and the danger that could have been involved. So this is a judgment call. This is something that I'm sure Pat could do and I could do, but for things that cr that fire critical, fire safety critical, I, I like to have a professional do it, someone who's authorized and trained to do this properly. Um, and I don't have, I don't think I have a uh, torque wrench that will be able to do that. Maybe you do, Pat. I do. Yeah, Pat's got every tool in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Still, we're not even sure that was the problem. I just kind of assumed it was, so I, I pass it on to Pat. But Pat, I think, did the right thing, and maybe you should pick it up from here. <laughs> so I, I emailed my electrician, Patrick, and I said, here's the situation, and this is the suggested next step from Tesla was to you know, check the connection and tighten it down appropriately. And he emailed back saying, um, I'd love to help. I'm about to go out of town for a week, um, but I've seen this problem before and you should contact Tesla because this could be a faulty wall connector, wall charger. So I thought, all right, he's, you know, he's got this experience. So in this case, every time I've had a conversation with Tesla, it's been through a chat. Inside the app, right? No, well, inside messages. Oh, um, you know, whenever I've talked to them about anything, sales, um, follow up for uh, a repair, and, and you know, obviously, I've reached different people. So I thought I'll start there. So I sent a message and crickets. I, I didn't hear anything back. So within the app, there was a contact me, and it was to send an email. So I sent an email. And then they requested photographs of the wall connector as it sat on my wall, the face-on photo of the handle coming from the wall connector, and a face-on view of the receptacle in my car, the charging receptacle in a car. So I sent all three pictures off. And then they wanted, oh, the additional thing they wanted were the identifying numbers from my wall connector. And I forget the abbreviation, a TSN number or something like that, I think. Um, and I could get that uh, unique code that was on the side of the wall connector. It was in my paperwork and so on. And I sent those off and they came back relatively quickly and said, uh, it appears your wall connector is um, faulty and we're going to send you a replacement. And then you just send us back the old one, no charge. Well, wait. Did you in your wildest dreams expect that Tessa would take ownership, say it was their problem, and send you a free one? No. For After a year and a half of sitting in place and working, no. I expected, you know, this was going to be on me. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I was elated. And um, the additional bit of good news, because, you know, electricians are not cheap, um, is it included instructions on how to do it yourself. And it said specifically, no electrician needed to do the install. So uh, I was happy about that. And, and I got the tracking number relatively quickly. And a couple of days later, I saw that the box was going to arrive. And um, I thought, well, I, your suggestion, maybe Steve might enjoy coming over to um, <laughs> help me on this endeavor. So what did they, what did they actually send you? So when when you look at a Tesla wall charger, wall connector, you see a 
a white outer part that has the little lights that go up and down to show you that electricity is flowing. And then there's the handle on the side. Then there's kind of a black part that's bolted to the wall and apparently mysterious electronics inside because I've never seen the inside. Yes, they sent me all they sent me an entire wall charger as if I was buying a new one. Oh, Um, not just the part I needed to replace. So the panel that attaches to the wall and the wires coming from the house attach to that panel. And then it has um, a couple of metal mm, phalanges. I don't, I don't know what you would call them. <laughs> Clips? But it's in, essentially, it's the, the part of the wall connector that everybody sees, the big white part that has the cable attached to it, is basically just plugs into that wall connector. So no... The only screws you need are to keep it in place from falling off. So the electronics are in that outer cover piece, not in the part that's bolted to the wall and connected up to the big scary wires from your house. Right. The 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 dangerous scary wires are made available to that white connector piece by these little, you know, phalanges. Um, phalanges. Yeah, phalanges. <laughs> little little pieces of like- metal. Phoebe would be proud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and it and it basically entailed unscrewing um, two uh, hex bolts at the top and two underneath at the bottom, and uh, just pulling it off the wall and putting the new one on and screwing back those bolts into place. And Bob's your uncle. You're done. And, and the reason you don't need a, an electrician here is because. Those big old 240 volt cables that need the 50 foot pounds of torque, they don't move. They're assuming those are okay uh, because apparently, and this is amazing, Tesla can sense the fault remotely from that wall connector. I think they have the ability to pull it in some fashion, assuming it has power, and get some data from it. Either that or they just assume it went bad, but I don't know how they would assume that. Uh, for instance, if it did have the burned out wire condition, they uh, mm-hmm. what you know it's they you you we would not have been able to replace that because that would require a reconnection of those two hundred and forty volt cables. So they somehow they knew that it would just require the front plate with the electronics, which, as Pat described, is pretty easy to unbolt. And put in the new one, and it just plugs in. I think the reason I wanted to have Pat and Steve tell this story is because um, there's certainly been enough publicity lately about some mistakes Tesla's making, in many of our opinions. And to have a good news story, I mean, it's not good news that it failed, but I think the second best thing to stuff that works forever is when a company stands behind a product and gets it fixed for you really quickly and doesn't, you know, doesn't give you a bunch of hassle about it. Apple, uh, sorry, I've been having trouble with them. Uh, and, and you know, and did it for you and did it for you for free and gave you instructions and it didn't cost you any money. You couldn't charge your car for about a week at home, but you have a lot of other alternatives, right? Yeah, well, I use the, uh, the what do you call it, the travel charger? The charger that uh, that I was lucky enough to have included in my um, car, you know, so that I could plug it into a normal 110 outlet. Um, so that was very slow, but it was better to have that than nothing or, you know, have to find a supercharger somewhere and, and pay extra. I think it's six miles an hour. Is that right, Steve? I mean, the mobile oh. charger has different um, adapters you can put uh, on it which will account for different uh, voltages and currents. But if you're look, plugging into a regular 15 amp, 110 volt outlet, you're going to get three to three to five miles per hour of charge. I, I, I want to say it was closer to the three mile an hour range. <laughs> Six would have been awesome, huh? Yeah, you know, we have an adapter, Steve, that will let us plug it into 210, 220. Is that right? Yeah, 220, 240, whatever it takes. <laughs> I was just waiting for it. So <laughs> 220 then, uh, that's like a dryer outlet. And and you have to be specific about the connector shape, right? The 220 comes in a bunch of different shapes. Well, the specific one we're talking about is a 30 amp 220 volt or 240 volt connector. So it does have, it's a keyed, it's a keyed plug. All of them are, these are 
uh, standards. So this one um, that we use when we go to Lindsay and Nolan's is is 30 amps to 220 volts. And that charges at about 20, I think about 22 miles per hour of charge. So that works out yeah. really well for us because they've got a dryer that's right outside of the, the driveway and we suck their solar panels dry. We don't feel too guilty because we helped them pay for the solar panels. So we... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we don't uh, don't mind doing it, but it works out well because we're there for a couple of days, and by the time we leave, we have enough charge to get back home. And that's using that same travel charger. But we did Steve did have to buy those adapters, and it bothers me a little bit that you have to have this electrical engineering background or a very practical understanding of electronics and 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 circuitry of you know electricity in a house in order to know which one to buy and how to do that. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't necessarily have that, but they study up quickly to find out what they need because you're going to spend 30, 35 bucks a pop for each one of those adapters and you don't want to buy the wrong one. But luckily, luckily they're shaped, they're all shaped uniquely. So if you just have a good picture of the outlet or the plug, you can find out which one to buy pretty easily. I remember we were going to see our friends Dean and Suzanne out in Utah, and Steve was making Dean crawl behind a cabinet <laughs> to get pictures of his 220 outlet in his in his house so that we could make sure we had the right adapter for his house. He also bought a, uh, a little Y adapter to plug into the 220 outlet that gives you two more, basically it's a port multiplier, right, for two more uh, 220 connectors and then an AB switch to go between them because everybody got tired of us unplugging the dryer and then have it plug the dryer back in and plug the car back in behind a dryer. And now there's a big switch out in front that, that lets us uh, share the, so, share the plug. So it's important to know this doesn't let you power both of them simultaneously. It's one or the other. And that's what the <laughs> switch is for. Right, right. Well, thanks, Pat, for for telling us about this. I think it was an interesting story, and and I liked learning from Steve all the different things that it could have been. Um, you know, turned out it wasn't the worst case scenario, which is awesome, and that uh, Tesla really came through for you. And and working through an app where you never even had to talk to anybody on the phone is is pretty cool. I think. Yeah, definitely. And they were by email; they were very responsive. You know, so so that was nice as well. Well, very good. Well, here's to happy charging. And uh, thank you for both joining me to tell the story. I think it's uh, it's fun to once in a while have a good news story about Tesla. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, that was a lot of fun, but it's going to wind things up for this week. Do not forget to send in your 1,000th episode recordings to Steve by June 23rd by emailing him at steve at podfeed.com. Did you also know you can email me at allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? You don't have to have a deadline for it. If you have a question or a suggestion, just send it on over. And remember, everything good starts with podfeed.com. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeed.com slash Mastodon. And if you want to listen to the podcast on YouTube, you can go to podfeed.com slash YouTube. If you want to join in the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocella castaways. We're all in there talking about iPad Pros right now. It's a lot of fun. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal. Remember, that orphanic bill is not free. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, you will not be able to do it this Sunday, but you can head on over to podfeet.com slash live on most Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.